Cool. Well, welcome to uh, the first event of the uh, English Department Lecture Series. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we have uh, three uh, really exciting events up uh, for the semester. Uh, so on uh, the March 30th, um, there's going to be a uh, graduate student film panel um, featuring uh, three graduate students from the English Department at 11.30, uh, location to be announced. And then Pallavi Rostogi is going to be uh, presenting uh, a paper on Bollywood cinema on April 27th, and that's in um, conjunction with the, uh, the film program and a bunch of other co-sponsors, the list of which I forgot. Um, uh, but um, please, uh, Join me in welcoming, uh, we have three uh, really exciting uh, speakers uh, for today. Um, Zach Godshall makes fiction and documentary films, both short and feature length. He recently completed a feature called Lord Byron, which premiered at the 2011 Sundance Film Festival, which is his second film to appear in Sundance. And as Mari uh, has it here, we have the postcards to be hung, handed out. Uh, Mari, what's it? Ta give them the screening time. Oh, and the screening time, which is April 1st at 7.30 p.m. at the Manship Theater at the Shaw Center. Um, $10. Very reasonable. From me. Uh, uh, that's right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Some things change. Some things change. Uh, Mari Kornhauser is the newest addition to. Uh, the writing staff of HBO's hit series, Treme. She's a screenwriter and director with three produced feature films starring such actors as Nicolas Cage and Mickey Rourke, as well as an associate professor of screenwriting in the LSU Department of English. And our moderator for today is uh, music writer, film critic, uh, music critic and entertainment uh, aficionado extraordinaire, uh, John Wirt uh, at The Advocate. Uh, so please uh, help me in welcoming them. And the last thing I'll say is um, we're also putting together um, an exciting uh, program for the fall. So uh, if you're thinking about putting on an event or you're interested in putting on an event, uh, just send me an email, which is bkahan at lsu.edu. OK, thanks. Well, th well, thanks for coming. Uh, I think I'm really lucky to be here with two very talented filmmakers, directors, writers, producers. They, they, do, they do so much and they've accomplished so much, um, as, as all you guys know. Um, let, me, let me start. I'll just ask a few questions. I think you guys have probably lots of good questions that are better than my questions, but I'll just start, start with uh, Zach here. Zach, uh, I mean, you've had two films go to the Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah, which is maybe uh, certainly among the most important film festivals in the whole world. Uh, again, not only once, but twice. That's, that's so great. Uh, what was your, your latest experience like there? All right. Um, <clears throat> well, it is a, it's a huge honor you know, to go up there. And this, uh, this film that I made, Lord Byron, made it for almost no money with a very small group of friends and, and non-professional actors in Lafayette. And so then to bring this movie uh, to Sundance was, a, was a, for me, it was a really big deal. Um, it was also, um, which I think somebody pointed out, uh, this is the first film with an all Louisiana cast and crew that goes to Sundance, so that was pretty cool. Um, but going there the first time, I was, uh, First film festival I'd ever gone to was a Sundance Film Festival, and I uh, it was the first film I made, and it was like totally overwhelming. Didn't didn't you know starstruck, and kind of just following the uh, you know the bright lights and you know kind of looking for uh, <clears throat> the important people to talk to and that kind of stuff, um, and I kind of felt like it was a little. I mean, our film that we made then was another was a, was a film was very much. Uh, homemade movie, meaning that we didn't go and like get money from out of 
state. We didn't go get money from you know Hollywood, or we didn't hire uh, out all kinds of cast and crew. We just made the movie in New Orleans with a group of friends after Katrina, and so in a way, I felt a little bit disheartened by that experience at Sundance. It was really great and honored to be there, but I felt like I was I didn't get what I really wanted needed to get out of it. And so this time around. I thought it would be it'd be better to kind of approach it in a more realistic way, and so I tried to hang out with filmmakers and meet other like-minded people, and so I, I didn't um, look for the important people, or actually I found the really important people, which were other people that were like me, and um, I met so many more people this time, and already uh, some of these guys have come down, um, guys and girls have come down to Baton Rouge, just strangely enough, a few weeks ago, one of the filmmakers was on the Southern Circuit tour, which goes around. Uh, the South, and they do, they do a show at the Manship Theater, and these guys were making a film, and so I got to already work with them and to help them shoot some scenes uh, just around town, and uh, and then I think later, uh, I think I did, I did the same thing a, a couple of weeks ago. I don't know. I've already kind of started working with some of the people that I, that I met at Sundance. So this is all, this is a this is a huge thing, and I think that's that was the best experience for me. It's also a great thing to show this strange little movie that we made in Lafayette to uh, you know, a, a room full of 300 strangers you know, several times over the course of a week. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very much a, it was a lot of fun too. Hey Zach, you, uh, you asked one of my, I mean you answered one of my questions before I asked it. I was gonna ask you, you know, the difference between your first experience at Sundance and your second and you, you, you went into it uh, nicely there. Well, you know, you're a Louisiana filmmaker, and this is a, you know, perhaps unusual part of the country, and, and certainly a distinct part of the country. Do you think people out in the greater world there, like at Sundance and around the country, can get Louisiana? And you ever think that maybe you're too uh, distinctive and individual a filmmaker from too distinctive and individual a place? Um, well, uh, I hope I am. Um, but also I think that the fact that these two films have gone to Sundance and then my other film God's Architects played at a number of film festivals and uh, was pretty well received outside of Louisiana and you know, hopefully that that says enough that um, that people are responding to it I do think that it's always a uh, proud moment for me to show one of these films here in Louisiana because then it's kind of like this is where we made it this is uh, kind of in a, in a way who really want to like it more than anyone. Um, so it's, it's a proud moment, but it's also the most nerve-wracking moment. It was to show the film for the first few times in Louisiana. So a couple weeks at the Manship Theater, I'll probably be more nervous than I was in or was at Sundance. But um, uh, I think it's, it is true. I think there's a sense of humor in this, around this place that uh, you know, I think people here maybe appreciate in a different way than um, elsewhere. Um, sometimes uh, <clears throat> there's also uh, just a, a way of way with words that people have people have a way with words um, down here. It's unlike even the rest of the South. So um, sometimes that's a little bit of a barrier, but more or less, I think I think audiences are kind of ready for that kind of thing. I think they appreciate that. You know, I, I'm thinking about Amari now and and Treme, and that's another you know Louisiana story. Um, can can you, you know, that, that that's it's such a great thing that you you did that. Can you tell us? Um, you know, I think this was in the LSU newspaper a few back in September. But can you tell us how you made the connection to Treme? Probably a lot of people, you know, want to advance their careers and learn how to succeed in in television or film. Can can you give us a little background on that? I, I actually have my own mic. Oh. <laughs> It's a girl thing. Um, I think I advanced my career by not wanting to advance, mm -hmm. actually. Um, I knew Eric Overmeyer, who was one of the co-creators with David Simon of Treme. And so we kept running into each other over the course of the months that they were shooting the film. And he asked for my honest opinion of the show. So, um, when it came on, I sent him an email and continued to send emails. And then we kept saying, let's have brunch, let's have brunch. And of course, it was too busy, too busy, too busy. And so finally, we had 
brunch, and I, we had brunch in May, I think it was, and at the very, very end, because we were just catching up, and at the very end he said, have you ever thought about writing for TV? And I said, with a really sincere shock, you mean your show? And uh, he said, I went, hell yeah. And then he asked me to submit a writing sample, which I did. And um, then there was some mysterious process that I have no clue what happened. And I got a call in July, and I thought it was a telemarketer, because it had a strange area code on it. And so I was really mean. And <laughs> it turned out, and the person at the other end was kind of shocked at my meanness. And I also had work going on. And she said, hi, this is Nina Noble. I'm the executive producer of Treme. And I went to myself, oh, no. <laughs> and she, I said, oh, nice, nice to you know, hear from you. And she said, well, I'm sure Eric's kept you in the loop. And I said, mm, no. And she says, well, everybody's read your work, and we think you'd make an interesting fit in the writer's room. But of course, uh, no one knows you except Eric, so you have to come up and meet everybody, and obviously it's subject to HBO approval. So I think at that point, I said, uh, holy F, or, or holy S, one of, the, <laughs> one of those two expressions. And then, uh, then I said, well, how should I prepare? And then, and then the thing went on, and then they flew me up, and we had a dinner, et cetera. You know, I'm curious about what, what was your react, what did you tell him? that you thought of the show, what, what was your evaluation of the show? I saw every episode, and uh, so I, I'm very familiar with the show. I, I don't really remember my, I think the first, well, it's complicated, because I was there for Katrina, so, and for a lot of the rebuilding, and was going around doing videographies, so it's a very complicated experience to, watch it over again in some odd way. And yet, they really did capture a, a, a cultural aspect to it and, and, I, and really capture some moments that really happened in, in Katrina. So I think, I don't remember exactly what I said to him, but as episodes proceeded, I would give my thoughts or uh, if I thought they were maybe missing a point, I would put it in the context of how a writer would give notes. It was always uh, how I thought the show was working, but if I felt that it, they were maybe not, not understanding Katrina agoraphobia, yeah, I would put uh, examples of how to play that within a character's point of view within the show. Is that what you mean? Something like that. <laughs> um. Well, can you give us an idea of, will this season, which is, starts in April, I think it's April 13th? 24th. April 24th? The DVDs uh, for season one come out March 24th, I think. Is this season going to be different from the first season? Will it be different perspectives? And uh, Well, um, first of all, I signed to a confidentiality agreement, so I okay. can't, can't yeah. do You can't reveal I, I that. I can't be too specific. I understand that. I can only say what David and Eric have said publicly which is, they added John Seda, he's a new character on the show, um, and the other characters will still be on the show. I think there was a lot of setup. I don't know how many of you have seen the show. Has anybody seen the show? Okay, so it's not like, who's seen The Wire? Okay, it's, it's not like, The Wire was kind of about capitalism, and so it dealt with those structures. This show is more about culture and what happens when a city is destroyed and how to rebuild culture. So how many are familiar with New Orleans culture? Well, it's as complex as as many hands went up. <laughs> so there was a lot of explaining to do in the first season. I mean, who knew, I mean, talk about not understanding certain cultures, you know, Mardi Gras Indians, the importance of a brass band, of a trumpet, you know, going, being played by someone going down the street. These are all extremely important to the city of New Orleans. So there was a lot of, um, not expository, but showing the rest of the country what, 
almost was lost when the great water bomb destroyed 80% of the city. And I feel kind of sad saying that with what's going on with Japan right now because its magnitude is so much larger. Um, but in any case, this was the largest landmass destruction since the Civil War in our country. So it had you know, effects on how to rebuild or not to rebuild. And the, like The Wire, it has multiple characters, but not all of them um, connect in quite the same way they did it in The Wire. So each episode is almost like writing an Alt Robert Altman movie because you have multiple characters moving Yeah, forward. there's so many characters. So many characters. A lot of them are musicians, but not necessarily. No, they have a, a chef, uh, Mardi Gras Indians, uh, different types of musicians. Uh, they have uh, uh, modern jazz, kind of like Wynton Marcellus or Terrence Blanchard. Then they have Wendell Pierce plays a <laughs> trombone player. Um, and then they have, like I said, the chef, and then they have the buskers on the street. They have a, a civil rights attorney, and on and on and on, I could go on. So this season, I think, because it was set up last season, they could move more into to characters and more into infrastructure. And since it's all four years it, you know, previous, we're dealing with the timeline of, of I want to say, Thanksgiving 06 to May of 07. And Treme also does this, this wonderful dance of fact and fiction. So it uses real events as, as touchstones that the characters glance through or participate in. And so we'll probably be dealing, you know, I think crime, you know, education, you know, rebuilding the things that started to kick in in 2006 and 2007. How they fit into the storylines, I can't tell you, but those were said publicly. Not many of you guys have HBO or have seen the show. You know, you have to have premium cable to see it, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, the DVDs but are coming out. Yeah, that's, that's right. You can do the Netflix or any of that stuff. And so it's a really special show and uh, a lot of good performances. And, and if you like The Wire, you know, if you're familiar with The Wire, you you'll recognize a lot, of, a lot of the actors. And Homicide, you could go back to Homicide with Melissa Leo, who just won the Oscar for uh, The Fighter. Very well deserved, I think. And you know, which brings me to something, I wanna get Zach back into this conversation, but I noticed uh, on your information, Mari, you have worked with at least three Academy Award winning actors. Yeah. That's great. And I think Peter Sarsgaard deserves an Academy, too. Mm -hmm. He's of that caliber. Mm -hmm. Well, Zach, have you seen the Treme? Um, I, I also don't have HBO, but I uh, saw the first episode, the first season. I'm going to get the DVDs, though, so I want to be up to speed for whenever I get to episode Mari's. Episode five. Yeah. Okay. Mari, you're going to be episode five this mm -hmm. season? Well, it, how it works is uh, the showrunners on any TV show tend to write multiple episodes, mm -hmm. and then they have... In this case, I was hired as a staff writer, but basically uh, where you meet in the writer's room, it's this complicated union, uh, writer's guild union thing that I didn't understand because I'd never worked TV before. So there's a, I didn't even know how to fill out my, uh, my pay thing correctly. The writer's guild had to call me up and coach me on how to do that. But the, the writing part is basically freelance writers uh, where they have one, two, three local writers which is amazing for, for a show to A, be placed the writer's room where it's shooting and then hire local writers is, I mean, David Simon Eric, you know, and Eric, uh, that's extraordinary. Well, that, that reminds me, you know, in watching the show, those guys, the, the, Simon and Overmeyer, they are, I think they're obsessed with authenticity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and it really does show. Um, they love the city, don't they? Well, David comes from journalism, and Eric was a playwright. So David is, in particular, you have to source your, uh, and Eric too, you, you can't just give an idea, it has to have sources. You, you can't, they'll listen and entertain any idea as long as mm -hmm. there's some authenticity or fact behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so you would be primarily responsible for, for episode five, is, is, is that correct? Well, how it works is, um, 
it's the showrunner, my episode, I share a story credit with David Sands, Ampersand, for those of you that, that don't know, now that you read credits, if you're Ampersand for the Writers Guild, that means you're a team. And if it's an and, it means it was rancorous, in most cases. <laughs> it means someone was brought on to rewrite you. <laughs> and you were booted off in some ennoble position. Uh, so <laughs> David and I share a story credit, and I get the sole teleplay credit. And that tends to be true for, you watch any of TV shows, and the, the standalone writers who maybe just have one episode each will usually share uh, a story credit with one of the showrunners, at least in all the TV shows that I've seen. And our staff is relatively small, what I've been told. I'm new to television, so I... Uh, Zach, do you aspire to write for television as well? I didn't aspire. It just right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Is, uh, not necessarily, um, but I think it, it uh, something that I'm open to. I'm open to probably anything, especially an opportunity like this. I was thinking about this. Is it's it, not television, it's HBO. That's right. Yes. <laughs> so this guy, David Simon, is uh, probably one of the most important writers writing in any genre right now. And... It's just incredible that you're working with him. I know, how lucky am I? I know, it's really <laughs> something. Uh, and <clears throat> so yeah, an opportunity like that would be fantastic. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> otherwise, I'm not, I'm not, I think a lot of writers, you know, they work years trying to get a job like that. And um, I, uh, <clears throat> gonna more or less just trying to keep doing what I'm doing, trying to make more films. Uh, if TV comes along, then that would, like, I don't think I'm gonna pursue it. If that's what, uh, maybe season three of Treme. <laughs> um, you know, in the LSU article that appeared back in September, which is a nice piece that... Um, it's the Daily Reveille. Uh, written by, I can't pronounce, I have trouble with Reveille, I have trouble pronouncing that, so. But it says Sarah Eddington wrote that, she did a nice job. But it mentioned that, you know, you, it mentioned that you were interested in watching their process. I mean, you're an experienced filmmaker, done lots of work, but you thought that you could learn something from oh. the whole HBO, or, or at least let's just say Treme experience. Oh yeah, there's, there's two learning experiences. One is actually being in a writer's room and working. It's really different because it's David and Eric's show. So in some sense, that's a great relief because the target's off your back. You know, when you're writing for a feature, it, it, it's, and, and you're managed to make it to production, that you're it, which is good and it's also sometimes bad. So it's kind of a, re, it's a relief and then to actually be able to help make the vision come true and then to have the collaboration of everybody in the room and learning how to do that and seeing the, their process was one aspect to it. And basically, he's like, Dickens, you know, The Wire, you watch everything back to back, if you can. The same is with Treme, you know, it, it, it's a completely different show when you watch all 11 hours than if you go from Sunday to Sunday. And that's how they prefer to have their work shown. So you're producing an 11 hour feature. How, how do you do that, you know? So it's this whole, how they shoot, how they, how they prep, how, how they edit. You know, it's because it's this machine, and it has to be, it's not like a feature, if Zach's going over, he could be 103 minutes or he could be 99 minutes. You know, Treme has to be, I don't know the time, 58.47 seconds, I'm just making that up. Or if you're shooting for a network, you're gonna be maybe, you know, 47 minutes. So each cut has to incorporate the title sequence, the song, you know, all the stuff that Treme is, is known for, or True Blood, or in any show, it's the same thing. But it's just such a long campaign to produce, uh, which I had never experienced before, because working in independent film, your films tend to be as short as possible, because you're running out of money. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, there was a lot to learn. And in some sense, I'd wished I'd gone, t if the timeline, had allowed it, it would have been interesting to, and I think helpful in the writing if I had watched the first episode be shot and then written my episode. 
with David. It would have, I think, informed me more of the process, which is distinctly different than teacher. A, because it's much quicker, and two, because of how they design the show. Each show is, has to be seen through a character POV. And you, you images, and it's just different when you do a feature. So your show has already been shot, and were you on the set? Yes, except for the one day I had to teach at LSU that was on the opening. Because <laughs> it was last semester, which you, you were out yes. the entire semester. Thank, and, uh, thank you, LSU, because I couldn't have done it. Uh, yeah. have, it was hard enough balancing one class with this. Well, you know, uh, Zach's, not all, but a lot of Zach's work is uh, our Louisiana stories, and. Treme is a Louisiana story. Um, are both, you know, since we're in Louisiana, a lot of people come here and make movies that have absolutely nothing to do with the state or the place. And if you saw Battle of Los Angeles, it doesn't look like Baton Rouge or Louisiana. It's, it's, and I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. You know, I saw the press notes for Battle of Los Angeles. Neither Baton Rouge nor Shreveport nor Louisiana are even mentioned in the press notes. They're not even going to tell anyone they shot it here. They're here for the tax credits, of course. So I'm kind of wondering, how devoted are you guys to Louisiana stories, regional stories, southern stories? Because you're here and you're, you're telling stories from this place, and your stories have been about this place. And so I'm just curious about that. Um, well, I, uh, I've thought about this a little bit. I think it just comes naturally. Um, I mean, I really like. South Louisiana, I like living here. I like the people here, and I like the the places um, here. So, uh, and and I <clears throat> I find that um, a lot of times I just get uh, inspired just by kind of going out into the world um, that exists right here. Um, I lived in California for three years, and every time I would visit back here, I always wanted to be here uh, because I would be more inspired. My imagination would just get more excited just being around Louisiana, and it wasn't necessarily like that growing up, it just leaving for a while and then coming back, it uh, made a big impact, and um, I, don't, I don't know, I, I feel like it's more of like a natural fit, it's just more of a less practical decision, makes sense, um, and I'm, I'm writing some things that are set in Louisiana and some things are not, um, so I'm writing a film right now which is uh, set in Appa Appalachia, and then uh, Another story that's set uh, in the swamps, so. <laughs> well, um, let me just speak practically, that the more Louisiana can shoot for other places, the longer people will shoot here, because that's what really makes the location destination, is to actually match for other cities. So it, it's great, actually, as stinky as the mo uh, movie kind of looks. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen it, it's not my kind of movie. But uh, so that's really good. For for me personally, I've all uh, the movie I which was at HBO uh, with Mickey Rourke was actually written for Louisiana, but ended up being shot for financial reasons in Montana. So they had to change all the kind of local stuff. And then the film I directed with Peter Sarsgaard was before the. Now we have a crew base, you know, back back. Uh, Ten years ago, the crew was like one and a half deep, so it was really hard to make little little movies here, and the technology wasn't quite as advanced as it was now. So I couldn't afford to actually shoot on my budget, so I had to change the locale to California in order to shoot. That would be different now because there's enough people. The crew is like really deep. A lot of like on Treme, a lot of people are moving here to actually work here. Someone from Canada moved the script supervisor on Treme moved from Montreal to Louisiana to, to work. And that's hap it's really happening where people are moving back. Um, honestly, I, I've, I, you know, on my own work, I've been having a little bit of a struggle since, since New Orleans has been so changed. Because everything I wrote kind of has such a sense of place. I still kind of discovering it, which is what I found so ironic about writing, being hired to write for Treme. Because it's sort of like God is giving me some psychological uh, palette to work out my own 
personal stories. And so, you know, post Katrina in New Orleans, a uh, really rich palette to work upon, huh? Yeah, I mean, I just haven't gotten a handle of, of my way into it, I mm -hmm. think. What's next, Bo? What's next? Oh, um, well, I'm still being Tremeized. I have, still have doing that and finishing out the semester and teaching summer school. Uh, I'm not sure. I kind of, I'm going analog. I decided I'm, I'm sick of computers and things. I, I want to do something really strange. I just want to write in moleskin notebooks and take Polaroid pictures. It may have something to do with the Patti Smith ba uh, memoir with Robert Maglethorpe that I just read. But I kind of, uh, that's kind of where I took out my old Holga and I bought it back uh, that now takes Polaroid film. So I'm waiting to kind of start experimenting with that. And I, I mean, I'll end up doing film, but I just wanted something that didn't have to go into a computer, and I can't really explain it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very frustrating to uh, to edit on a computer. It's easy, but I mean, I get sick of computers. It just drives you nuts after, you know, yeah. <laughs> weeks on end, you know, six, seven hours a day. Um, anyway, the computer screen uh, editing is, is, it's like a time warp, but anyway. Next, I'm, I'm writing a few things. I'm writing a couple of different scripts with a couple of different friends, a couple of different writers, and uh, hopefully make a, another fictional film um, within, a, within a, or at least begin within a year, hopefully. Um, and also, I'm hoping to maybe make another documentary. There's a couple of uh, subjects which I'm, I gotta do some more exploring on. Making a documentary can take uh, such a long time. You don't necessarily know exactly where you're going. Um, I mean, at least I don't uh, with these two stories. And so I want to kind of clear them up a little bit before I dive in. Because you can just dive into a world and, and it can just... It took me, I think, by the time I started God's Architects and the time I finished, it was over three years of time. Um, That's short. And, yeah. Or no, it was actually four years. Because I started shooting that before, lo and behold. And I took a year off and then came back to it. So it was making a documentary can take s such a long time. Um, so anyway, I think I'm going to maybe try to look into a documentary, but uh, definitely writing a few things, which I think have some, have some traction. Yeah, I'm writing things. I just never talk about them. Yeah. Hopefully uh, get some money to make a movie this time. <laughs> <laughs>